All right, let's talk about refraction. This is the second half of geometric optics, and it is the component to uh, that goes in associated with lenses and light passing through windows and going through water and the kind of illusions that you get as a result of that. You know, for example, if you look up top here, you know, it appears that this wine bottle is split right down the middle and somehow the glass is to the left and to the right. Now we all know that that's not really what's happening. And this whole phenomena can be explained through this idea called refraction. So what is it? Well, refraction in its simplest definition is the bending of a wave when it enters a medium where its speed is different. So it really all has to do with light slowing down. So before we get into the quandary of this effect on the left here, let's kind of talk about this bit in the middle here. There's this term that we're going to learn that we're going to use called the index of refraction. It's basically a number that gets associated with a material that talks about, that really shows how much light slows down. So how we identify the index of refraction is pretty straightforward. You're going to take the absolute speed of light, that's the C value here, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And so C is the speed of light in a vacuum, which means no medium, no material at all, basically space. And C for all waves of light, so all waves within the electromagnetic spectrum, is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Again, this is everything in the EM spectrum, not just visible light. We're talking radio waves, microwaves, gamma rays, the whole deal. And so the index of refraction of a material is the ability to slow that light down. So it'll be the speed, the absolute speed of light, C, divided by the actual speed of light in that material. So if V slows down a lot, let's say V is half of the normal speed of light. So instead of it being 3 times 10 to the 8, maybe it's 1.5 times 10 to the 8. You would simply do 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 8, which turns into 2. So it's just a ratio. And basically that means the speed gets cut in half. A lot of folks will refer to the index of refraction as the optical density. Don't get that mixed up with actual density because it's not necessarily, it could be, but it's really the optical density, the ability to slow light down. So if something's very optically dense, it'll slow light down a lot. If it's not really optically dense, then it won't slow down much at all. And you will find that there are tables that show you the index of refraction for various materials. Of course, we're going to have materials that light can actually pass through. So you're not going to find, you know, solid blocks of steel written here because light won't pass through that. So it's going to be mostly uh, fluids and glass-like objects. Um, let's take a note of a few things. For example, air has an index of refraction of 1. Now, that's not actually true. It's more like 1.00 and change. Uh, it's just a little bit higher than one. Um, so for more, more or less, we treat air like a vacuum, which means that light travels at C, 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second when traveling through air. And then we see something like diamond. Diamond is very optically dense. It will capture light and slow it down quite a bit. In fact, that's why diamond tends to glimmer and shimmer. That's why people like it. And then we have other things like glycerol, lucite. These are you know, various different substances that will slow light down based on the material. And as a result, they'll have their own index refraction. Now, these indices are all experimentally determined. There's nothing in theory that says water needs to be 1.33. It just happened to be 1.33 through experimentation. So why does light slow down? Well, there's a couple ways I'm going to try to explain it. The most common route is talking about an analogy of light in a medium to a two-wheeled axle rolling along a surface. If I take a two-wheeled axle and I let it roll along smooth pavement, it's going to roll nice and parallel to its motion until it starts to hit the new medium. Now, if it's approaching our new medium at an angle, and that new medium in this case is mud, you'll see that part of that car, or that tire, I should say, that axle, enters the mud before the other part. As a result, this portion slows down sooner than this portion. This side, over on the right side, is trying to go faster. And as a result, it's going to cause the whole thing to bend inward a little bit. I'm sure you've experienced something similar to this. If you don't believe me, take a two-wheeled object or even a four-wheeled object and 
roll it across maybe your hardwood floor to the carpet at some angle, you'll notice it turn a little bit. And so it's going to turn towards a center line. And so we're going to refer to this center line as our normal line. So where the medium meets, where the two boundaries exist, draw a normal line. And when you go from something of lower density to higher density, the object will bend towards that normal line. So that's the case for light as well. You'll notice that light, when going from air to glass, in this example, the incident angle, which remember is always drawn in reference to the normal, that's still true, the incident angle will be bigger than the refracted angle. And so therefore it bent towards the normal line. It went towards the normal line. So theta 2, which is sometimes written as theta r, in this example is less than theta 1, which is often written as theta i, your incident angle. I can show that in this little simulation here too. As I change the angle, that ability to bend might change, but ultimately you see uh, this wave front bending inward, again towards that normal line. What happens when we're straight on? Is there any bending at all? No, there's not. You do need to understand, though, that light will still slow down when entering this medium, right, as you see here. The angle just won't change. It won't miraculously start turning left or right. If it's going straight on, it's going to keep going straight on but slow down. And that analogy of the two-wheeled vehicle is still true there. If you take a two-wheeled vehicle on pavement and you push it straight towards the mud, once it enters that mode, it's going to keep going straight as long as both wheels hit the mode at the same time. It's just going to slow down. So again, you go from less optically dense or a low index of refraction to a higher index of refraction and bends towards the center. This is a great tool to remember. And so the opposite is true when we're going from a more dense medium to a lower dense medium. So let's say the light is actually originating in the glass. As light tries to leave the glass, it's going to bend away from the normal line. So in this example, my index of refraction, I'm sorry, my angle of incidence right here is inside the glass. So this is what we might call theta 1. And then my refracted angle, which might be theta r, we'll call theta 2. And in this example, theta 2 is going to be bigger than theta 1. And again, that two-wheeled object traveling from the mud to the pavement really still works. It's driving maybe at a slow rate, and then once one wheel ag exits that mud first, it's going to be able to speed up a little bit. It's not going to have as much resistance, and it's going to turn a little bit. But then once it's completely out of that mud, it'll be traveling at a nice consistent value and the nice same orientation. And again, uh, this can be shown in this example here. Uh, we might be in a heavier medium or a more dense medium here, I should say, and then it bends outward. Okay, So when it speeds up, it bends away from the normal. And we'll go back over here. When it slows down, it bends towards the normal. And it turns out that this kind of origin of material to the angle of incidence and how it changes in your new material ends up being a nice perfect little ratio that we call Snell's Law. And it's a really straightforward rule that deals with refraction and it basically states that light that originates in one material times the sine of that angle in which it falls incident upon our new material must equal the new index times your refracted angle, sine of your refracted angle. Or ultimately um, this ratio of n to sine, or n sine, must maintain the same value. So if the n goes up, the angle goes down. If the n goes down, the angle goes up. It's going to be pretty straightforward to apply this equation. Once you know what medium it begins in, maybe that'll be n1, you look at your tables that, they are, that are usually provided and figure out what that n1 is. And then you look at what the new material it's going into is. And you just take a protractor and you measure one of these angles and you can calculate the other angle. Or let's say it's an experimental setting. Maybe you want to know what this material up here is. Maybe it's some sort of glass and you just don't know what type of glass yet. Well, you can shine a laser at that glass. You'll notice how it bends away. You'll mark it on paper. You measure these two angles with your protractor. Maybe this side, N1, is air. So you identify 
uh, the value of air, N1 times sine of that original angle now must equal uh, N2 times sine of my new angle. Rearrange for N2 and bam, we now know this type of material. That's the basics of refraction. Okay, It starts to kick up a notch once we start understanding how we can manipulate rays to our advantage or disadvantage. Maybe we're trying to focal, focus images such as with cameras or glasses. Another interesting effect of refraction that I do want to discuss before I wrap this up is this term called total internal reflection. I've seen some people refer to it as total internal refraction. Uh, it's most appropriately referred to as total internal reflection. And it's a pretty neat effect. So what is total internal reflection? Uh, it's First, let's just look at the equation. There's this concept that says that at a certain angle light will not pass through a boundary. It'll completely reflect inward. We call that angle the critical angle. Basically what that means is anything greater than that angle will stay trapped within the medium. It'll never exit the boundary. Anything less than that angle can refract. Let's look at this chart down here. Simple scenario here where we have light originating in, gra in glass and trying to exit into air. Now this green light ray is traveling at a small enough angle that it will leave and it'll refract. This red angle, as we increase that green one to the red ray, is at the critical angle. The critical angle, it'll try to refract, but it basically gets trapped and it'll end up riding along the surface. Therefore, theta 2 in this scenario is equal to 90 degrees. If we're larger than the critical angle, it won't refract at all. Instead, it'll completely reflect, and it'll bounce back inward, and it'll follow the law of reflection here. Now, in order for this quandary to take place, the light always needs to, uh, to originate in a more optically dense medium, and always needs to try to go into a lower optically dense medium. So if this started in air and tried to go into glass, it'll always refract. It'll never actually stay trapped in air because air has a lower density than glass does. However, the light that originates in the glass can, once we get to that specific angle or larger, reflect inward. I like to think of this as skipping a rock on a pond. If you take a rock and you approach the surface of that water at the proper angle, it'll never enter the water. At least it won't initially. It'll bounce off. It'll skip off. However, if you take that same rock and you simply just change the angle in which it approaches the surface, it will go right through the surface of the water. Now, why is this so awesome? Well, one great example is the world of fiber optics. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Fiber optics is a very common or increasingly common way of transmitting data from point A to point B. Old school way would take electrons and have them travel through copper wires from point A to point B. Now, whilst that is not a terrible method of communicating, it's not the absolute fastest way we can communicate. The absolute fastest way you can communicate is to communicate through light. So if you can have one signal enter a tube, and then have on the other side of that tube the signal leave, you're now communicating. Turn it on and off in a very different uh, you know, series of ways, zeros and ones, and you have communication. Well, so that's exactly what fiber optic line is. It's allowing us to transmit information using EM, using light. Instead of traveling through a wire, it's actually bouncing around in a tube. And it's really simple. It's this m medium that's more has a higher index of refraction than the light that's surrounding it. And instead of it exiting that medium, it's going to stay in it. It's just going to bounce along. And it's going to travel at a very high speed. Well, the speed of light, if it's in a perfect ideal scenario. Total internal reflection, pretty cool stuff. All right, that's it for uh, refraction. We've covered straight up refraction, index of refraction, the ability for light to slow down. You've got Snell's law, the ratio of the or originating index to its incident angle to the angle in which it might bend or the new medium that it'll be traveling into, and this concept of total internal reflection. Thank you.